happy to listen to you. Great. Uh, thank you so much for organizing such a wonderful conference. Appreciate it. Uh, the title of my talk today uh, is uh, the same as the title of a, of a paper I've been working on uh, with uh, Thomas Barrett. But really, I'm going to talk about uh, um, a larger body of work that I've uh, done with Hans Halverson and Jim Weatherall, along with Thomas, and um, some of the papers leading up to this one and some papers that, are, that have come after uh, this one and some that we're working on now. Okay, so in the second chapter of his book, World Enough in Spacetime, uh, John Ehrman uh, constructs an elegant hierarchy of classical space-time theories. And the hierarchy tracks both the geometric structures involved, uh, but also the associated space-time symmetries. And he finds that as the space-time structure becomes richer, the symmetries become narrower, and the list of absolute quantities increases, and more and more questions about motion become meaningful. Following Ehrman, uh, I will present a hierarchy of space-time symmetries today, uh, but instead of comparing the symmetry properties of, diff <clears throat> excuse me, of different space-time theories, I'm going to restrict attention to general relativity and compare the symmetry properties of different space-time models within that theory. So uh, the hierarchy turns out to be analogous to, say, the hierarchy of causal conditions that's long been used in the foundations of general relativity. And I'm going to highlight uh, uh, a few connections between this symmetry uh, hierarchy and uh, a hierarchy of causal structure. Um, let me just uh, say that there's many levels to the symmetry hierarchy. I'm only going to because of uh, time, I'll only be able to focus on four today. So here they are. Uh, these are the four that I'll, I'll, I'll be focusing on. And uh, I'd like to emphasize that, you know, as we move up the hierarchy, the symmetries uh, uh, decrease. And so the structure increases. And it turns out that with this additional structure at each level, one is able to prove uh, uh, various types of things. And so, again, this is kind of analogous to the hierarchy of causal uh, uh, conditions. So I'll take one example, you know, a, somewhere up at a certain level on the hierarchy of causal conditions, one is able to prove that the causal structure of space-time is rich enough to, say, determine the topology of space-time. This is um, a, a classic result by David Malman. It's uh, actually going to be uh, coming up uh, a bit later in the talk, uh, but that, that gives you an example. So as you move up the hierarchy, one is able to do more and more. Um, and in, 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 in just the same way that, you know, uh, with globally hyperbolic space times, one is able to prove an awful lot more than if one is just considering uh, uh, chronological space times. Uh, each of these four levels corresponds to a recent paper that I've written with uh, either Hans or Thomas or Jim, um, and, and here they are. We'll also be talking about some future work with Thomas and Hans. Okay, so let's start. Let's consider some preliminaries concerning isometries. I just wanna make sure that we all have uh, a good idea of, uh, of the, the definitions. Um, there's only a few definitions, but I think being very, very clear about what one is saying is, is, is important. So uh, here's my uh, definition of a spacetime. It's a, a, a pair MG where M is a manifold, G is a Lorentzian metric. The usual uh, background assumptions concerning the manifold are in place. It's smooth, it's Hausdorff, uh, and so on. Uh, we say that space times mg and m prime g prime are isometric if there's a diffeomorphism from uh, m to m prime such that when you push forward g, you get g prime. And let's say that the collection of isometries from a space time to itself 
are the global symmetries of space-time. So again, one uh, could uh, possibly explore many different types of definitions of a global symmetry of space-time. I wanna be very clear, this is what I mean by a global symmetry of space-time. And it's the one that Wald uses in his book. It's very influential within the, that literature, Garrosh, Penrose. It's also the one that uh, Ehrman uses when he's constructing the hierarchy of, of symmetries uh, in classical space-time structure. So again, been very influential within the philosophical literature. So uh, I understand there might be other definitions of symmetries out there. I'm focusing today on this one. Now let's consider a, a very influential construction used in uh, discussions of the whole argument. So let MG be a spacetime and let H and its complement have non-empty interiors. Uh, well, we know there is a whole diffeomorphism from M to M, which is non-trivial in the whole, but acts as the identity outside of the whole. That's what I mean by a, a whole diffeomorphism. So uh, a trivial proposition one can prove is that let MG be any spacetime and let uh, psi be any whole diffeomorphism. Then uh, the spacetime MG and the spacetime M where you push forward G, those models are isometric. And the isometry is realized by psi, the whole diffeomorphism. So here's the picture. I think we're all familiar. Okay, now for the quiz. Ehrman in his second chapter has a quiz at the end. Here's my quiz. And I, uh, yeah, uh, I'll, I'll just say that uh, in the past few years, uh, I've had many email discussions, many discussions via referees, many discussions in person, where I come across people holding views uh, consistent with A, B, and C. Uh, I'd like you to think about the question for a minute here. A whole diffeomorphism is blank, an isometry from a space-time to itself. Is it always an isometry from a space-time to itself? Is it sometimes an isometry from a space-time to itself? Or uh, is it never an isometry from a space-time to itself? Uh, okay, the answer, is C, never. So a whole diffeomorphism is never an isometry from a space-time to itself. Trivial doesn't count, I take it. Trivial doesn't count, yeah. Uh, but but uh, 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 trivial would be not a whole diffeomorphism because by definition, I have to move something non-trivially in a whole diffeomorphism. Uh, this follows from a very general uniqueness result that's been around since 1969 from Garrosh. And uh, a simple corollary is that a whole diffeomorphism is never a global symmetry of a space-time. Okay, uh, let's now uh, consider the, the hierarchy. Let's construct, let's start with the bottom and move our way up. So the weakest condition in the symmetry hierarchy draws on the whole construction just considered. So the condition essentially requires that when the global symmetry of space-time are fixed in an open region, however small, then they're fixed everywhere. So following Garrosh, we'll refer to these space-times as rigid to avoid confusion with the, uh, the whole argument. So we say a space-time is rigid, if for any open set in the space-time and any isometry uh, from the manifold to itself, then uh, uh, if psi is the identity on the open set, then it's the identity everywhere. And so we show that every space-time uh, is, is, is rigid. Now, uh, despite the fact that every space-time is rigid, you, you might get the sense that this is an uh, extremely weak condition um, I, th I think it's fruitful to explore situations where uh, space-time is not rigid. And so uh, here's another proposition that's related. Uh, Non-Hausdorff space-times always fail to be rigid. So uh, here's the picture. Consider uh, Minkowski space-time, and you've got two origins that are non-Hausdorffly uh, related. These are the witness points, 
witnessing the non-hazdorfness. And now just consider a bijection, which takes each point into itself, uh, but exchanges the witness points. Uh, that bijection turns out to be uh, not only a diffeomorphism, but uh, an, an isometry. And so uh, uh, fixing the global symmetries outside of uh, a hole, which contains the, the, the witness points, will not fix what happens inside the hole. So the space-time is not rigid. Or uh, you could say uh, that non-Hausdorff space-times have a certain type of symmetry holes that standard models do, just, just don't have. Okay, now let's talk about the next level. So the next condition in the symmetry hierarchy requires that the global symmetries of space-time just be completely fixed. One doesn't have to fix an open set somewhere to fix it everywhere. It just comes already fixed. So we say space-time uh, MG is giraffe if the identity map is the only isometry. So uh, here's a way to think about this. Uh, David Malament uh, suggested one way to construct a giraffe spacetime. You take Minkowski spacetime, you take a compact region shaped like a giraffe, uh, and you delete it from the manifold. So here's a giraffe spacetime. Here's another giraffe space time. This one is much, uh, it, you know, it's it, you, w w one can work with it. It's easier. It's uh, uh, a portion of two dimensional Minkowski space time. Uh, you just cut this little triangle out, delete everything else. Now you've gotten rid of all, all global symmetries. The only uh, isometry from this space time to itself is the identity map. Of course, any giraffe space time is rigid. Every space time is rigid. Uh, the direction does the other direction does not hold. Uh, Minkowski spacetime is a counterexample. All sorts of symmetries, global symmetries. Uh, so uh, it's not giraffe, but of course it is rigid, as we've as we've seen. Uh, I want to emphasize that virtually all example spacetimes you've ever seen in your life are not giraffe, and yet, everyone knows that giraffe spacetimes are actually generic among spacetime. I think that tension is, uh, you know, uh, something interesting to, to uh, just meditate on, because I think we're accustomed to thinking about spacetimes with symmetries, when uh, our universe probably has none. But the meaning of gen generic in this context is never made precise, and a general proof does remain uh, elusive. Partial results are available. Uh, namely on compact uh, space-times due to mountains. All right, time for the next level. The next condition in the symmetry hierarchy uh, requires that the local symmetries of space-time be completely fixed. And uh, I'll say what I mean by that here. So uh, we say that a space-time is Heraclitus if for any distinct points P and Q and any open neighborhoods around these points, there is no isometry from one neighborhood to the other, which takes P into Q. So in other words, uh, uh, we, we, we see that since any neighborhoods of distinct points fail to be isometric, we have a sense in which each event is completely different from every other event. Uh, and so you might say that in such a world, it's impossible to step into the same river twice. Okay, one can show that any Heraclitus spacetime is giraffe, of course. Uh, the other direction does not hold. So back to this example, we see uh, that, of course, it's giraffe. It is not Heraclitus. This is a flat spacetime. So every point is exactly like any other point uh, in terms of there is a local isometry uh, uh, there that one can set up. So not only does this spacetime fail to be Heraclitus, it sort of maximally fails to be Heraclitus. Uh, one can show that a Heraclitus spacetime does exist. So let me say a bit about this. It's good to have a feel for what a Heraclitus spacetime looks like um, and feels like. What uh, just, just a, a concrete example certainly helps me. 
So start with a portion of Minkowski spacetime in standard TX coordinates and call it MG. So this is the portion I have in mind. It's back to that triangle. Here, down here at this point, this is the this is the origin in the in a standard coordinate system for Minkowski spacetime. So um, I'll be referring to the origin, but the origin, of course, is not included in the spacetime. We we've deleted it. Now, what you do is you consider a scalar function, uh, which is the Euclidean distance from the origin, and then a conformal factor where the conformal factor is just one over that Euclidean distance from the origin. Now consider this conformally flat spacetime. The claim is that it is Heraclitus. So how do we know that? Well, uh, we use scalar curvature and in, uh, invariance to do this. So one can show that the Ricci scalar uh, has this uh, e expression here. And it follows from that, that any local isometry must map P to a point Q with the same Minkowski and distance from the origin. And so the picture is that if I'm uh, considering a point Q and I wanna map it, even locally map it to another point in the spacetime, I'm constrained to map it where my Ricci scalar is the same and the Ricci scalar is the same only on that blue line. Uh, now I construct a different scalar, I'll call it Q, where I just take the covariant derivatives of R and uh, use the inverse metric to form a, a scalar function. And uh, one can show that Q takes this form. It's, it's uh, proportional to both R and F squared. And so you can work out the details. It follows from this that any local isometry must map P to a point Q with the same Euclidean distance from the origin. So uh, here's the picture. The, uh, uh, the point must be mapped somewhere on this red line if the uh, uh, f values are going to be preserved. And so taking these two constraints together, then uh, if you're considering a point, you are forced to, uh, that you, if, if there's a local isometry, you have to map the point to itself. And that's true for every point in the spacetime. And so there you get that uh, uh, the spacetime is Heraclitus. So you're actually proving something much stronger than the Heraclitus property there. Uh, I'll say a bit more about that in a moment, but uh, I have a question, which is, uh, do four-dimensional Heraclitus spacetimes exist? We've constructed a two-dimensional one. Man, I've, I've, I've tried. I really have tried. Uh, I can't figure it out. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any reason why you would have a block here to be able to do it. It just, things get really complicated. Presumably, one would have to find four different scalar curvature invariants and play them off of each other like coordinate systems like I've done in the, in, in the earlier uh, example. So really what's going on there is that my curvature invariants are, are, yes, playing the role of coordinates. And so I use those coordinates uh, uh, to um, uh, prove this, this Heraclitus property. Um, and there, yeah, so can one do this in higher dimensions? Um, but uh, Heraclitus spacetimes are uh, highly structured at each point. So this allows for some pretty crazy uniqueness results. Remember, as we're going up the hierarchy, uh, the structure is increasing. This allows us to prove more and more results. So here's something that you can show at this level of the hierarchy. Um, let's start with a couple definitions. A, a pair of spacetimes are locally isometric if for each point in the first one, there's a neighborhood around the point that you can embed into the second one and, and vice versa. And then uh, we have to define what a local property is. Let's say a property of spacetime is local if given any two locally isometric spacetimes, one has the property if and only if the other does. So then you can show that uh, Heraclitus spacetimes are locally isometric if and only if they are actually isometric. That is, um, that's, that's kind of crazy. So uh, a corollary there is given any collection of local properties, there is at most one Heraclitus spacetime with exactly those properties. There's a uniqueness result here. It's telling me 
you don't have to tell me what the global structure of your space time is like. You just tell me the local structure at each point and I'll be able to put the puzzle together in a, in a, in a unique way, if it's possible. Of course, it may not be possible. Uh, so one could rephrase this by saying for Heraclitus space times, local structure just determines global structure. And of course we have the, the, the other way around, global structure determines local structure. And therefore these two structures are um, uh, um, kind of similar in this way, when what one can recover one from the other. Uh, here's another uniqueness result. So uh, consider uh, a space-time MG with a, any property P. We say that this space-time is P maximal or P inextendable if the space-time cannot be properly and isometrically embedded into some other space-time with the same property. And uh, it would seem that Leibnizian metaphysics uh, would demand that space-time be maximal with respect to various uh, physically reasonable properties. And now uh, consider uh, this definition of observe observational indistinguishability. One spacetime is observationally indistinguishable from another. Uh, if for each point in the first, there's a point in the second such that their causal paths are the same. Uh, there's an asymmetry in the definition here, um, uh, which will be important in a, in a moment, but um, there is a general underdetermination problem when one considers the class of all possible spacetimes but uh, you can show that if one restricts attention to Heraclitus maximal spacetimes, so these are spacetimes with the Heraclitus property, which are also maximal with respect to this property, then observationally indistinguishable space, uh, 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 these spacetimes are observationally indistinguishable if and only if they are isometric. Uh, so we uh, have Heraclitus asymmetry, Leibnizian maximality, gives us no underdetermination problem. Or another way to put the point, for Heraclitus maximal spacetimes, the observable structure uh, determines the global structure. Okay, and now uh, finally to our, our, our highest level of the hierarchy, uh, this condition requires spacetime to have maximal curvature structure. So for any manifold, you can consider the uh, collection S of M of smooth real valued scalar functions on M. And associated with each spacetime, MG is a collection CMG, which is a subset of S of M. These are the smooth invariant scalar curvature functions constructed from the metric and its associated Riemann curvature tensor and covariant derivatives. And now we can consider the following definition. Uh, let's say that a spacetime is maximally structured if the collection of uh, invariant uh, scalar curvature functions just is the collection of smooth functions. In other words, every smooth function you can possibly imagine on the manifold corresponds to some invariant scalar curvature function. Uh, so one can show that any maximally structured spacetime is Heraclitus. Question, does it go in the other direction? Um, I don't know. It would be cool if these two conditions were uh, turned out to be equivalent. Um, but uh, yeah, this question is open. Now, uh, maximally structured spacetimes do exist. And so here's a sketch of the proof. Consider the Heraclitus spacetime that we already uh, took a look at in the previous section in standard TX coordinates. Uh, this is just, again, conformal Minkowski spacetime. Use invariant scalar curvature functions R and Q that we already took a look at to define invariant scalar functions T and X, where T and X are, um, uh, they mimic the coordinate maps, the global coordinate maps. So uh, then you consider an arbitrary function on M. You put that function in, in coordinates T and X. You can uh, reconstruct that same function by using the uh, 
invariant scalar curvature of functions big T and B, big X uh, in place of the coordinates. And so you can uh, build your smooth invariant scalar curvature function, which uh, just is whatever uh, F you, you, you gave me to start. So at this highest level of the hierarchy, uh, some even stronger uniqueness results are available. Uh, we know there are a number of senses in which the scalar curvature invariance can be used to determine the local geometry of space-time. There is a literature on that. But in general, one finds that such functions do not determine the topology of space-time. Uh, for example, one finds that local invariance cannot distinguish a plane from a flat torus. So let us uh, make this claim precise. Let mg and m prime g prime be space times and let c of uh, mg and c of m prime g prime be their uh, uh, collections of invariant scalar curvature functions and let them be indexed by a set i to generate the respective families of functions fi and f prime i. And we do this in such a way that for each i, fi and fi prime, they correspond to the same metric construction. So however you're constructing your scalar curvature function from G, do the same thing with G prime. Now uh, we say a bijection from one manifold to the other is a curvature isomorphism. If uh, for, all, for, for any I that you choose, when you pull back uh, the uh, F prime, you just get F. So F prime of I pulled back just is F of I. And so you can show that uh, of curvature isomorphism, it need not be a homeomorphism, uh, let alone a diffeomorphism. So in this way, the situation is completely analogous to the one concerning the Malament result. Uh, you set up a curve, uh, 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 I'm, 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 I'm sorry, a, uh, a causal isomorphism, and you show that at uh, low, low levels in the uh, causal hierarchy, uh, a causal isomorphism just isn't a homeomorphism, but that at some level it is. Uh, so to show in this case that uh, the result doesn't uh, go through, just consider any bijection at all between any pair of flat spacetimes with different topologies. So uh, for example, consider Minkowski spacetime and Minkowski spacetime with a point removed or a torus of some kind uh, one finds that when one pulls back any scalar curvature function from the one spacetime to the other, uh, you you, uh, you get that the, the um, uh, functions are the same. So you have a curvature isomorphism, but you do not, of course, have a homeomorphism since by construction, these uh, spacetimes have different topologies. Uh, well, you can show that if you're willing to go all the way up to maximally structured spacetimes, a curvature is isomorphism not only is a homeomorphism, it's, it, it has to be a diffeomorphism. So uh, the result is completely analogous to the one uh, from Malament showing that sufficiently rich causal structure is going to determine the topology of spacetime. But I want to emphasize a very important difference between the cases. The causal structure of spacetime is encoded in a particular relation between spacetime points. Relations come to the fore. Uh, on the other hand, the curvature structure of spacetime is not uh, encoded in a relation between spacetime points. Instead, each scalar curvature function gives rise to an invariant property of each space-time point. And the scalar curvature structure of space-time is encoded in the collection of all of these properties of all of the space-time points. And so what I'm saying is that maximally structured space-times have so much structure that even the properties of space-time points uh, determine the topology of space-time. You don't need any relations to do this. Uh, what justifies the label maximally structured? 
Uh, here, here's some current work with Hans uh, and Thomas. So uh, given a maximally structured spacetime MG and any tensor field whatsoever, T on M, one can explicitly define T from G. So uh, in particular, any global coordinate map that you might be interested in uh, is explicitly definable from the metric. In addition, any other metric, G prime is explicitly definable from your original metric G. And so we can say uh, that for maximally structured space times, all structure is curvature structure and any structure can be explicitly defined from the local metric structure. Okay, uh, let me just close by uh, with a brief review of where we've where we've come. We've looked at four conditions of a uh, symmetry hierarchy or asymmetry hierarchy. As you move up the uh, uh, hierarchy, symmetries uh, are reduced and structure increases. There are uh, a number of levels in between, but there's nothing lower than rigid and there's nothing higher than maximal structure at least that I uh, have considered. Maybe there is, uh, of, of course there is. Uh, uh, whether it's of interest is another matter, but um, uh, at the lowest level, rigidity, uh, this is the condition that holds when fixing the global symmetries of a space-time in a little uh, open set fixes them everywhere. And uh, what we saw was that every standard space-time in general relativity is rigid, but that uh, you can find non-rigid examples of spacetimes if one is uh, uh, considering non-Hausdorff models. Then we bump up a level uh, to giraffe spacetimes. These are the spacetimes where the global symmetries come already prepackaged, fixed. There's only one isometry of a spacetime to itself, and that's the identity map. And uh, these spacetimes, uh, of course, are rigid. Uh, the implication does not go in the other direction. Uh, these spacetimes are, or it is thought to be generic in some sense. Um, and yet um, most of the standard examples that one uh, sees in the literature, whether that's textbooks or research literature, uh, these spacetimes are almost always giraffe spacetimes. Uh, then the next level we bump up to Heraclitus here is where we not only fix the global symmetries of a spacetime, uh, uh, or the, 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 the global symmetries come uh, fixed, the, also the local symmetries come fixed. Um, a Heraclitus spacetime is one in which one can't map distinct points into each other, even, even locally. And at this level, now there's tons of structure, both globally and locally. And with this, especially the local structure, one is able to show that uh, certain claims follow that didn't claim lower uh, down on the hierarchy, but, but now follow. And uh, one that we highlighted was, you give me the local properties of space-time and I'll give you the global properties of space-time. We also highlighted uh, another uniqueness result, which uh, es essentially uh, says that the observable structure determines uh, the global structure. Finally, um, we jump up to maximally structured spacetimes. These imply the, the, uh, the Heraclitus uh, uh, spacetimes, the, the other direction is unknown. Uh, so these top two levels perhaps may, uh, may be equivalent. Um, but at this highest level, we've shown that um, there's enough structure that you give me a pile of, of space-time points and you give me their internal properties. You don't tell me anything about how they're related at all. I can use that internal structure to uh, uh, give you back the, 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 the global top, topological uh, and even the manifold structure of space-time. Uh, and moreover, uh, one can use maximally structured space-times to um, uh, uh, can uh, explicitly define any structure that you're interested in, as long as that structure comes in the form of uh, a, a tensor field. Um, okay, uh, that's it. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, it's a technical material, but uh, you explained it very clearly. And uh, now we have uh, Brian Roberts, uh, which is your respondent, and he has up to 10 minutes to tell us something interesting about this. Uh, well, I think uh, JP has said all the key interesting things. I'll try to be really brief just to allow maximum discussion here. Uh, thank you, JP. Wonderful, wonderful. Lovely to see these things all tied together. Um, I've been following these papers, of course, uh, with interest. And so I, I, the hierarchy is just, I, I, just want, I just want more, really. So my first comment is um, there's another interesting work that wasn't mentioned here by JB and Jim Weatherall from 2014 regarding conventional conventionalism about space times. And so my first sort of question is, I wonder if you've thought about whether a relation of conventionality might fit into the symmetry hierarchy in some interesting way. Their thought, for those who haven't read this paper, first, you should definitely read this paper as well amongst all the others, wonderful piece. Um, their thought is when one says things like Heikenbach used to, like these two space times, uh, you, you know, you can't really tell which one you're in because there might be funny forces which make you think there's a certain metric which there isn't. And then JB and Jim very uh, reasonably respond, what do you mean by forces, my friends? <laughs> and you ought to have some minimal reasonableness constraining what you mean by forces. And that would mean something like F equals MA, or in a, in a relativistic sense, you'd want a, a two-form characterizing the, uh, the force tensor field so that you have F equals MA in a relativistic sense along every time-like uh, um, frame. So, uh, and then the result shows that for the class of conformally equivalent space times, there basically is no conventionalism. But of course, this condition can be relaxed. You could look, you know, for conventionalism in more general space times. Uh, and anyway, I just sort of wonder how this could potentially, some, some note, you know, they, they also point out that depending on if, you know, how uh, rigid you are about what you mean by force, there could be lots of other uh, you know, interesting notions of conventionality you could identify. You just have to tell me why you think that notion of a force is interesting if it's not a rank zero to anti-symmetric tensor. Um, so anyway, it just looks to me like some room to play here. I don't, to be honest, see how they would be related by implication to many of the things you've said, but I wonder if you've thought about this. Um, some other very brief comments. Uh, the original Garroch stuff was about limits of space-time. So I, I mean, I think one of the things that's being revealed here is interesting tension between these maybe two research programs, research programs involving non-Hausdorff spacetimes, uh, which you sometimes use for reasons of branching, among other things. I mean, people sometimes appeal to this when they want two points to get really close, just closer than you can get in an ordinary space-time. So branching could be a reason. Uh, but then, you know, these limits of space-times, of course, we have different options, but um, that, those, that rigidity result was used by Garrosh as a key step in showing the existence of so-called Garrosh limit space times. And, uh, and these are crucial in certain sorts of stability results, which you know, help motivate what it means to be a generic space time. So I wonder if there's a tension between these two sorts of research programs, those that adopt the Garrosh approach to limits and, uh, and people who might try to use non-Hausdorff space times for interesting modeling and physics. Um, Gosh, there's lots of other things to say, but I don't want to just carry on. Uh, maybe I'll just leave it at that. And uh, I mean, I'm sure other people have things to say about the whole argument. JB already knows what I think about that. So uh, I'll leave it there. And thank you again, JB. Wonderful, wonderful talk. Yeah, uh, thanks, Brian, for your for your comments. Uh, I, I really appreciate them. Um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of uh, try to uh, give a, a response. Concerning the conventionality stuff, yeah, uh, you know that I, I, I have never uh, 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 given that um, thought. That's that's in intriguing. I do know that you know we're just piecing this structure together. It's a very big structure. You know, like I said, I think it's analogous to the the hierarchy of of, of causal conditions. One one thinks about just all of the results that one finds there. Uh, I'm not on that level. I can't prove, uh, you know, I, I'm not on the level of a, uh, of of uh, a Mingazi, for example. And so um, I'm very, very slowly working my way through this stuff and hitting mainly the really simple stuff. Uh, uh, that sounds uh, a bit complicated, but there might be something there. And with as this structure kind of builds out a bit, 
uh, more and more results presumably will be collected. But I appreciate the heads up because I never would have even thought to put those two uh, things together. Um, uh, about the limits of space-time uh, paper by Garrosh, yeah, um, that's that's the context where this general uniqueness result shows up, and 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 as you as you emphasize, Brian, you're you're absolutely right. This is the result that sort of forces the uniqueness of limits. One could take limits in all sorts of different ways, uh, and uh, 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 it just turns out that the the, the rigidity of space-time, in the sense that I've been talking about, which relies on on the Garrosh stuff. Uh, um, uh, picks out a unique kind of limit to to look at. Um, but you mentioned some tension. Uh, and so that that's the part I'm still, I, I don't know um, what exactly tension, like I, I want to get a better grip on, the, on that part. Um, uh, uh, as I, as I see, see my project, of course, um, it's, it's no surprise. I just, I just uh, have these, these definitions around um, uh, and I, I prove things with these definitions. And so, of course, the things, uh, the, the mathematical theorems are true. Uh, and so there can't be any tension concerning the, 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 the results, uh, of course. So uh, I, I guess I'd like a better picture of, of what that tension looks like. Um, yes, but I, I, I sort of had in mind, or sorry, if, if I wasn't clear, maybe uh, the idea that if you take yourself to be modeling physical phenomena with non-Hausdorff spaces. And you want to say things like, um, my, uh, my result is robust under, you know, perturbations in the sense that there are nearby space times that all share the same property. That's yep. in non-Hausdorff spaces, I take it the lack of a rigidity theorem means there's a lack of a well-defined limit here. So absolutely. it's not clear absolutely. how one would get. Yes, hmm. yes, a a yes, absolutely. So. Uh, I guess I guess what I would want to say is we already had reason to be sus uh, suspect of the non Hasdorf thing. Um, I have in my past work, I guess I've been playing that kind of open. I haven't come down one way or the other, whether I think, for example, non Hasdorf space time is physically reasonable or not. I've sort of left that door open. And, uh, you know, to be honest, I've kind of emphasized the other side. Which is probably what you're what what you're return what you're referring to. Now I can kind of see the, the tension. So I do have certain writings where I where I say, well, you know, if you look at something like uh, 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 an initial value uh, uh, formulation and it's in Misner space time, you can take a you know um, a, a a surface, put some data on it, evolve it to where you can't evolve it anymore. You have a maximal Cauchy development. And you see that in the Misner context, that maximal Cauchy development is extendable. And so then you're, you're thinking, well, we can consider various extensions. And um, it just turns out that uh, uh, in that context, the maximal, maximal extension, when you're really thinking about it, what, what Garrosh calls the natural extension is non-Hausdorff because it, it sort of branches. Um, and so it, 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 exactly like you said, uh, Brian, uh, it, it, it branches in some sense. Uh, it, tr it turns out that that particular model doesn't branch in another sense, but it doesn't matter for this context because uh, it is non-Hausdorff. And all you need is the non-Hausdorff property to show that the rigidity result fails. And so uh, taking a cue from what you said, uh, once you have that rigidity result failing, then now you don't have a good sense of limit. You don't have a good sense of uh, uh, genericity, maybe. Uh, and so then how are you going to be talking about nearby possible worlds when you're considering a non-Hausdorff model? So I think you're absolutely right that uh, this, these, these mathematical results are now coming down on the side where it's like, you know, uh, maybe uh, uh, non-Hausdorff uh, uh, space times aren't as reasonable as we might have thought, right? Um, and this is a reason why. Or to put it uh, in a slightly different way, Fixing global symmetries outside of a hole which contains these these witness points, it's not enough to fix what goes on inside. And so there's a type of indeterminism that just is not in play in the standard models. And so if people are worried about certain types of underdetermination or I'm, I'm sorry, indeterminism, then that's that's a type where you've you've got something going and you might be become worried about that. And and so I, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, this. This counts as again. This counts against non-Hausdorff models for sure. So thank you uh, very much.
Ok, uh, yes, thanks uh, for the talk and for the response. And uh, we can still uh, take uh, some questions. Mm. Uh, the... Thanks. Um, I wanted to ask about um, this issue of generosity. Um, and the, as, as you correctly say, <clears throat> pretty much any place time you write down um, is going to have some, some isometries, but if you regard that as non generic, I, I mean, here's the, the the sort of physics intuition reason to think that that I run with would would be something like, well, you know, take take a solution, linearize around it, um, look at small, you know, put a gravity, put a little pulse of gravity radiation pretty much anywhere, and it's going to break the symmetries. And so the, you know, I can think I, top in in a kind of intuitive sense of the topology, um, uh, I go I go an arbitrarily small distance from any symmetric thing and I'll find a non-symmetric thing. Um, I'd expect the symmetric points to somehow be topologically sparse. Um, what what are the problems in rigorizing that way of thinking? Is it just the infinite dimensionality of it that becomes troublesome? Yeah, what, uh, <laughs> what, what, what comes into play, I think, is what troubles uh, all sorts of uh, foundational results concerning genericity and general relativity. One can put, well, first of all, one would like to be able to take the entire collection of all space times and put a topology on that collection. Uh -huh. that, that turns out to be really, really problematic. And so instead what practitioners do uh, uh, is they will focus on uh, collections of space times having the same manifold, and then they'll put a topology on that. But the uh -huh. problem is, is that there are a number of different topologies one might consider, and none of them seem completely satisfactory. So, uh -huh. Um, that's a point that, that Garrosh made very early on when, when uh, the, the topic of genericity uh, was, was brought up when wanted to prove things that were generically true. Uh, it's also something that Sam Fletcher, I mean, that was kind of his dissertation is to pull out reasons why there just isn't a, uh, you know, a canonical uh, uh, topology to work with. And it just turns out that if one works with the compact open topologies, then results, of course, are easier uh, to to find in, 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 in terms of stability results, uh, but uh, the physicality there uh, uh, comes into question when one moves to the, the, um, the, the open topologies, uh, uh, the Whitney topologies, they're, they're sometimes called, then um, uh, it's, it's, it's much harder to get results. And I think that's the problem here with trying to prove that giraffe space times are uh, generic. The compact case is easy because in that case, then the two different topologies actually coincide. Uh, uh, so the physicality uh, of the uh, um, uh, compact uh, uh, topology is there. And so one, one, one can prove this result. My sense is, and, and this is not uh, uh, really something I've, I've looked into much. I know Sam was interested in this question of proving generally uh, that giraffe space times are generic with some interesting topology. I don't know of any work it's done other than this result that I cited uh, from Mount End in 2015. Thank you. Okay, uh, any other questions? Because, uh, other, uh, yes, but I don't see, uh, yeah, Jonas, please. Hi, thanks, that was really nice. Um, I, I actually just wanted to hear, um, I find this hierarchy of space-time structure intrinsically interesting, um, but I'm wondering if you could say, do you think there are sort of philosophical upshots to be had? Um, you know, do you adhere to various methodological principles involving relative amounts of structure, or do you think there are some theoretical virtues that come from considerations of comparisons or structure, or I'm just wondering where you go from here within uh, philosophy of physics. Yeah, yeah, you're trying to get me to say stuff that I don't want to say. I, think. I want you to say it. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's the thing is that I um, my project is one in which, um, yeah, I'm considering these very clear definitions and seeing what follows. There's already and so much to do there. Uh, um, of course, uh, uh, there, there's all sorts of interesting uh, topics that are related to 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 this stuff, and I'm certainly interested in that. Um, but I, I just keep um, uh, my 
cards pretty close to my chest and I, 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 I just see, see no need to wade into those waters when I've already got so much to do here. Um, uh, sorry to sidestep your question. <laughs> okay. Uh, other questions? I would like just to continue this. <laughs> Maybe you don't like, but uh, you are speaking about space times, but uh, what about matter and what about equations? Uh, what do you mean, what about matter and what about equa uh, equations? Uh, yes, so um, for example, matter should determine uh, the metric. So is this uh, somehow represented in your case? Or, for example, uh, there is uh, this, uh, some Oxford persons, <laughs> they think that uh, um, the symmetries of uh, matter determine the symmetries of space-time. But uh, you are speaking about symmetries of space-time as, as if uh, matter was not there. So what do you think of these kinds of uh, uh, dependencies which seem absent in your talk? Yeah, yeah. Uh, let me say something about that, but before I do, I want to push back on something that you said. Uh, you said that matter determines the metric. That's just that's just not right. Uh, uh, the metric determines the matter, but not the other way around. There's an asymmetry there. Uh, yeah, but if you have a massive thing, then you will have a curvature. If, if uh, you have no matter, then you can have a flat uh, space time. Yes, but 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 you can have uh, two different uh, uh, vacuum solutions on Rn, that yes, yes, different yes. metrics. So you. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, so without matter, you can have different solutions. But if you have matter, then you have a curvature. No, I I still want to push back on, on that. I'm sorry. Wh wh where is that? Where is that theorem found? Uh, no, uh, uh, maybe I'm not a specialist, but uh, uh, you're speaking about general relativity. Isn't it true that uh, as soon as you have, uh, uh, so, I, I mean, uh, massive uh, matter? Yes, yeah, so I, I guess what I want to say uh, about matter is, uh, in, in the background, of course, one has Einstein's equation. If you yes. give it a metric, uh, uh, then I can... Uh, 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 trivially define via Einstein's equation a matter field, a, 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 a TAB field, the stress energy uh, uh, field. And uh, so every spacetime uh, is, is a solution of Einstein's equation in that sense. And so if one is considering uh, a, a more restrictive sense, then uh, you have to say what that means. So sometimes folks talk about exact solutions or sometimes one might use energy conditions and so on to kind of limit uh, uh, what you're calling a solution there. Uh, but uh, my, my results here hold generally. And then if you wanna impose any constraints like that on top, uh, everything will, will go through. Uh, so nothing I've said here will be contradicted by that uh, discussion. It's a sub discussion of this one. Yes, okay, but uh, which um, you can have different distributions of matter, uh, but uh, you mean they will be um, the same um, matter and the same, uh, the same metric? Or will they be compatible with different space times? Uh, I guess I'm not sure ex uh, what, what, what you're asking. I mean, Einstein's equation is one in which uh, uh, if you give me a, uh, a metric, I can uh, come up with a curvature tensor and I can use that to define one side of Einstein's equation that contains the curvature structure, a certain type of curvature structure. The other side is uh, the, the, the matter structure. And uh, so I, I can look for solutions in a, very, a, a variety of senses uh, like I just said, every uh, uh, metric is going to uh, uh, produce some matter distribution via Einstein's equation. Whether one wants to count that distribution as reasonable or not, or is is a question that you can that you can uh, check out. 
But uh, at this level, you know, I, 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 I like to think of Einstein's uh, solutions as coming in levels. Uh, I'm, I'm working on the most general level so that my results are, are, are the most general. Uh, if one wants to impose any kinds of constraints on matter, like it seems like you, you might want to do, then I invite you to uh, impose those constraints. And then uh, you'll, you'll have a limited discussion, uh, but, but everything I've said uh, uh, will, will carry through. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, just in some discussions, uh, matter is supposed to be primary and what you uh, tell would be uh, coming afterwards. And <laughs> you uh, have a reverse uh, direction. Yeah, I, but I, I, I don't want to let this go because uh, it, it really is important to recognize the asymmetry of Einstein's equation. So uh, you can have whatever uh, opinion you want about matter and, and uh, the geometry of space time. But you just you're not allowed to have the opinion that uh, the uh, uh, the TAB field determines the metric. It just doesn't. It's just a mat- mathematical fact. Um, but the other direction does hold. You give me a metric, it determines a TAB field. So uh, there's there, there can be no disputing that fact. Uh, yeah, uh, you mean just there is a freedom uh, about vacuum. So when you, when there is no matter, you have different uh, options. Yes, but it's it's not just the vacuum, though. So you you do do you think that there is a, a a mathematical theorem that says you give me a TAB field that's non-vacuum, I can construct a unique metric from that? Because I don't know of that. I don't know. I do not know of that theorem. Who who proved no, that no. theorem? No, no, I'm not a specialist in such theorems, but what I'm saying, as, as soon as you have matter, you cannot have a flat uh, uh, solution. Well, that is true. Yeah, okay. <laughs> we can uh, call this a weak uh, determination uh, of matter, <laughs> of metric by the matter. <laughs> okay. Uh, as a Questions, uh, debates? <laughs> uh, yeah, okay, thank you for the talk. And uh, uh, yeah, I guess that you combined uh, uh, different <laughs> works uh, in it. Mm, so with this, uh, we should finish unless <laughs> someone has uh, the last remark, but uh, it's already quite late. So thank you uh, all uh, for being here and uh, to the speakers and the respondents and the public. Uh, we will continue these discussions at some further occasions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you everyone.